enjoy the first first session here. Okay. Well, welcome. It's a cool room. I like to think of it as the decompression space. Um, in case of not going to the other one. Um, so my talk is on psychology of UX and adoption. Uh, I'm a psychologist, um, not the couch type, uh, but I study psychology and interaction design. Um, and when I was doing that, I learned a lot about uh, models, like frameworks of how, like what drives people to adopt new technologies. Um, and in preparing for this talk, like over the last weeks, I've been trying to apply that to our space to see like how, how does it translate um, all these frameworks. Um, yeah, so that's what I want to talk to you about. But first, um, I want to talk to you about porn and why that will why that's interesting will become a bit more clear, I hope so, later on. Um, this um, magazine, Time Magazine, in 1992 declared hybrid porn specifically um, as one of the uh, bigger inventions of the past millennium. Uh, doesn't seem like a big deal, it was a big deal in agriculture, so it was a big deal for food around the world. Um, but it was also a big deal for understanding what makes people uh, adopt new technologies. Um, but, like, side note, but what's interesting, this is 1992, a special fall edition. Um, a lot of the content is sponsored by IBM. Um, there's a lot of talk about like networked computers. There's no word on predictions of like the internet as we know it now and all the services that we use on it. Um, even though that, that like this was 1992, so we would expect that to be kind of ubiquitous uh, knowledge already. Um, so the story about porn, um, I'm going to pick up some days here to check. Um, porn was invented, hybrid porn specifically, not porn. Hybrid porn was uh, invented in um, 1928 by uh, scientists of Iowa State University. Um, and then, Years past, it was released to farmers, uh, and it had a, a lot of benefits to speak of. Um, so the production rate could go up by 20%. Um, farmers could move to like mechanical uh, ways of production because like the, the way the corn grew had like, changed uh, like the the size or the equal height of the of the stem, so it made it easier to cultivate. Uh, it was also much more resistant to drought. Um, so there were a lot of um, functional benefits that would make farmers be like, yay, let's all like, switch to hybrid corn, right? Um, and then next to that, there was an alliance of farmers that also adopted this technology from the university and started pushing it and promoting it. Um, so there was a lot going for like, this, this new type of um, cultivating corn. Um, one of the downsides, because I mean, obviously there, there were downsides, was that um, farmers would need to buy their seeds every year. So they needed to change something in their behavior compared to what they were accustomed to. Um, and still, 13 years later, um, there was a team of sociologists that thought, oh wow, this corn business seems to be quite interesting. There's a lot of changes happening there. Um, and so they, they, they wanted to figure out like why, what made some farmers decide to switch to hybrid corns, others not yet, so it was kind of a big deal in that state at the time. Um, so they asked, like they, they sent out a survey to farmers in the state asking like why and when did you switch to this like new type of cultivation. Um, and what they found was that within five years, 10% had switched to this new type of production. Um, the three years after that, 40% uh, more people uh, were farmers switched to that new type of production. Um, no Excel yet, but they plotted the data. Um, and then they found this. Um, which if, you, if you've looked up, uh, any, like if you ever Googled like technology adoption, you basically always find this S-curve of like, okay, there's a, like a first 10%, and then at some point it like, kind of grows a little bit more, and then there's this, this switching, like this uh, critical point that we call like now there's critical mass. And this is what we all strive for, because at this critical mass, we'll, we'll get there. 
Um, that's when like mass adoption will happen. And then this is a guy who um, kind of summarized that research and followed up by doing loads of research after uh, in other fields to understand how does this translate? Is this S curve something that occurs in every new technology that we introduce? Um, his conclusion was yes, like he actually drew up that S curve with some variations of um, different technologies. Um, like interesting motivation for him to start looking into that was that he always saw um, his dad as a farmer um, kind of wait till the last minute when everyone was starting to use something new and his like uncle Eddie, another farmer, uh, would already use something new, uh, his dad would wait. Uh, and so he's also the guy that like kind of coined the terms late adopter, early adopter um, after investigating uh, that based on his family story. Um, what he talks about is not necessarily adoption, like the whole concept of adoption um, is fairly new. What he talks about when uh, he describes like studying uh, new innovations is a diffusion of innovation, um, which like in his descriptions is slightly different. Um, he actually says diffusion um, as, as a paradigm originates a bit more from anthropology um, because anthropologies, anthropologists look at things from the perspective of humans uh, and they tend to take on that perspective to then blame a system uh, or like credit a system when something, uh, something good or bad happens um, but always from the perspective of, of users rather than a system. Um, so Everett Rogers defines uh, diffusion as a process by which an innovation, which is one point, uh, is communicated, which is the second, over time, time is a very critical element according to him, and among members of a social system. Um, I started to think that what are then the difference between that like type of diffusion and what we now see as adoption and what we like talk about so very often uh, of reaching like, crypto mass adoption. Um, some differences if you look at like, the different models out there uh, are that diffusion usually uh, refers more to a society as a whole whereas adoption is more related to the decision of one specific individual. Um, diffusion relates to technology like an infrastructure um, whereas Adoption usually relates to a product or service, something built on top of that. Um, in terms of what it does, like functionally, diffusion relates to something being like supportive, um, not delivering the actual value instantly, um, whereas adoption is interactive, something that brings you value, you put some, some effort into it, it's interactive. Um, and diffusion tends to take longer. Um, so, and this is like study based on like a range of different technologies being introduced and it takes about 20 to 30 years. Uh, whereas adoption, if you think about like all the uh, popular web services, they take between 5 and 10 years. Um, hybrid porn was a really rapid adoption at the time for a new technology, taking around 13 years I believe. Um, and then also there's just a very different stream of research into both, um, starting with Everett Rogers but then um, there's this other guy, Errol Mann, um, who started to investigate adoption uh, more closely. So next to porn, um, an interesting example is the computer mouse, um, which was, um, is commonly credited as being invented in 1973. Um, actually, it had been around a little bit longer. Uh, and there was a really nice uh, post, um, I sh may have included the link, I'm not sure, um, by Bill Buxton, a um, great guy, if you haven't heard of him, uh, look him up. He has a wealth of information about how te new technologies grow. Um, he kind of describes the history of the computer mouse uh, that I think is very uh, analogous to uh, how, how we might be looking at um, 
let's say Web3 as a new technology. Um, so, right, so, yeah, the most credited to be invented in 73 uh, was actually um, 69. Um, and then it still took years and years before it to actually reach household adoption. So there were commercially available products, um, especially by Xerox Park. Um, but before they reached household adoption was in 84, um, which is um, yeah, pretty, pretty much a long time after. Um, the way Bill Buxton describes that difference um, is that there's actually, before that whole S-curve starts, starts, there's a long nose of like the technology um, being developed. Um, where you go kind of through like invention, which might happen at multiple points in time by different people. Um, there's like a refinement and augmentation phase, and there is like the productization, where there's like actual stuff built on top of a technology. Like in my mind, we're, we're kind of like in refinement and augmentation, like we're, we're not really there yet, and let alone that we are at that like place where you can start to think of it as an expert. Um, why the analogy to a computer mouse uh, to me is interesting um, is because the computer mouse needed an ecosystem and this is what made it um, last or take quite long for the technology to be adopted so it needed this place to use a computer mouse it needed programs to effectively control um, a graphical user interface um, and it needed all the manufacturing around it that took so long Is a link. Okay. Um, so looking at these um, kind of pillars or um, variables, I would say, um, that Everett Rogers describes that um, are required um, for um, diffusion of innovation to happen is like the innovation itself. Like it, it needs to be new and interesting to people. That like needs to actually add some some value. Um, it also needs communication channels. It needs a network of like merchants or like people that can sort of sell the technology, like the way the farmers had an alliance that would kind of vouch for the hybrid corn to be uh, more effective than, than their average way of working. Um, so it needs agents, is how it describes it. Um, it also needs time. It needs time for people to go through their phases of decision making. So they need to like gather knowledge of how this stuff works, they need to have time to decide if it's something for them. Uh, they need confirmation that when they start using it, it actually works for them. Um, and so there's all these stages that um, people need to go through first. Uh, and then there's a social system um, where it doesn't make much sense for me to have crypto if I can't use it anywhere else. Um, so it, yeah, definitely needs to have support from people in, in a closed environment. So that's, let's say, the, the diffusion of innovation. But when we then talk about adoption, which kind of grew later, what can we learn from that work that, that could apply um, to us as well? Um, there is several models that nowadays are referred to as adoption models but actually like in the early days they were called technology acceptance models um, mostly because you didn't adopt technology you accepted it because it was kind of enforced on or forced upon you by an employer um, these are i mean in themselves if you like models that might be interesting um, <laughs> there's a bunch of them what they have in common is basically these two factors. Um, something needs to be useful or at least perceived as useful and it needs to be easy to use. Um, and especially the first one, it needs to be useful. Um, at least from my perspective or where, where I'm standing, uh, I work for Status, um, which is very much infrastructure uh, oriented. Um, useful is something that doesn't necessarily resonate it's much easier for us to talk about the usability of the applications that we're, we're developing at this point um, so we could we could sort of add those those to the model 
Um, and then there's obviously a lot of knowledge about UX, which is also relatively new. Um, if you kind of look at the process of how like UX came to be, um, initially there was a bit more of a, a thing called human engineering when Bell Labs wanted to design the, the rotary phone, they were kind of struggling to decide do the numbers go on the device itself or on the rotary. Um, and they hired someone to test that and to like get, get input from people. And they wanted to design it such that it would fit humans, and they called it human engineering. Um, then the personal computer came, and the industry started talking about human-computer interaction. Um, which to me that emphasis is interesting because it's talking about the computer, the system um, as a whole at that point in time. But if you look at kind of what happened to the industry after that, when web technology started to come up, um, like the emphasis switched more to human interface design, so it moved away from the system um, and kind of moved up to the surface of like this is only what you interact with um, and that's what we'll try and optimize. And then even later, um, even though like the term started to be used in, in 93, um, if you look at like the actual definitions, user experience uh, happened. Uh, and that kind of only became popularized when services became yeah, more, more common on the internet. Uh, yeah, and this is so like looking at the definition of user experience, uh, how that kind of shifted over time. There, there was this concept already, like context of use from these applications, right? Um, will something work in a particular factory with given timelines? Um, that was kind of the extent of the usability. Then in um, 2010, there was a switch, and this is only 2010, it's not that long ago. Um, that user experience was added, um, as in the person's perceptions and responses that result from the use and or anticipated use of the system product or service. Um, these are standards, they're, um, they're not the most fun to read, but it's, it's interesting to see how they change over time. Um, by the way, it, it kind of looks like context of use um, is no longer important, uh, it was just moved to another position in the document. So, very much there still. Um, and then another thing that happened in 2010 was that usability kind of got this side note added to it, um, where there was like another emphasis on specified users, um, the goals, the context of use referred to a particular combination of users, goals, and context of use for which usability is being considered. Um, so again, this like reference to context. All right, so last year, uh, and I'm sorry to say that this was like already last year, um, with some folks of status, we went to uh, South Korea for a field research trip uh, where this context became uh, incredibly clear. Um, and also it became incredibly clear why we needed to be in the country to understand the context. Um, what we found was, I mean, obviously there, there had been a high adoption rate of cryptocurrencies, um, but what we found was that it was especially connected to the housing market, uh, the prices of the housing market, the social pressure of pressure for young people to buy a house, uh, and then next to that, the investment regulation and how difficult it was for uh, young people to find other means of investment than crypto. Um, so this whole context kind of played into um, why people started to use cryptocurrency, not like just to make an extra buck or because it seemed interesting. There was a whole um, sphere or context around it. And so, um, yeah, looking at like another uh, model, there's loads of these in psychology. This is also um, next to Don Norman, one of the, the fathers of UX, I would say. Um, there's this um, continuous uh, reoccurrence of there's something Sorry, that's my time. <laughs> There's some like, reoccurrence of um, something needs to be usable, but it also needs to be useful in the first place. Um, and that you see popping up over and over. 
So one thing that we can add like, is the importance of context, um, because we, we see it coming back in all definitions. Um, this is kind of like a side note, but a comment by this guy, Nielsen, that I find interesting is um, that over time we kind of switched from a uh, you pay first, then you experience something, to you experience and then you pay uh, with the introduction of service models. Um, this is, uh, it's an interesting thing to keep in mind because we're, in a way, reverting that. You pay first, you pay gas, and only then can you experience. All right, so from some of the studies that we did, there is uh, one more factor that I would kind of add to that model of what are things that are important uh, to at least think of or keep in mind or uh, check to cover our bases um, if we want something to be adopted. Um, what we found in Iran where we thought privacy is going to be super important because we build a messaging application. Uh, it turned out privacy was, yeah, it was important, but it wasn't super important. People had Telegram. Uh, it was blocked and that only made it more trustworthy for some reason. Um, what did come back over and over was this, uh, it should be common among every uh, among everyone and my friends should be on there too um, so this social network and then another one was from uh, I would say three months later um, when we did a similar study in uh, in Japan um, and in this study we would ask people like about the current messaging applications they use and we would ask uh, to write either a breakup letter or a love letter depending on like how they felt about their current application. Um, and yeah, when kind of looking at like, what, is it, what does an application mean? Uh, we've got through this like, I don't know, strategy of like write a breakup letter, or write a love letter, or make it really um, apparent. We got to things like I'd lose so many contacts or I'd be so lonely um, as kind of explanations for the use of technology. And this, like, to me, would be reason to uh, like emphasize or add uh, this. Sorry about the colors there. Um, this concept of human connection, specifically because it's something that we really do not seem to take into account too much. Um, as in any transaction I make um, on the blockchain, so far does not allow me to like add a note or receiving any any value does not allow me to say thank you, uh, which is a pretty pretty basic thing in any, any human interaction. Um, and looking at other applications, that seems to be one of the defining aspects. So that's kind of like, like the list of factors that I would keep in mind, like either looking at um, like the wider picture of the technology, but also at the lower level, like do we give people time between switching, uh, like trying out an application before they actually have to decide that they'll use it? Um, do we allow people to try something without backing up their seat rates? Um, so how do we fit into this, uh, this concept of decision making? Um, do we have enough communication channels or agents in place? Um, and there's, there's a bunch of more. I kind of see it as list of triggers, like things to think about. And that's all I have, except for the QR code, which I, I think you know a lot better what to do with that than I do. Uh, I was just asking about it there. I don't know. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, there's a few more coming in. Um, Thanks for being here. My name is Chris Sugg. I'm a UX UI designer at AirSwap. And today what I'd love to do is just tell you some stories about um, user research that we've conducted at AirSwap and specifically some of the challenges of adapting kind of traditional UX research methods to these specific users within Ethereum. Um, we're good. Um, and I guess right off the bat, I also want to say, you know, this isn't really supposed to be a prescriptive talk per se, but more so just sharing um, a very lean product team's attempt to conduct meaningful research um, within the space and figure out how to do it well. So I hope we can all chat about it afterwards. Come up to me if you're doing stuff better than we are. 
Um, so off the bat, here's the agenda. Um, we're going to do why use a research because we can't be in a place like this and not advocate for it at large. Um, we're going to talk about two kind of buckets of user research, um, and then we're going to focus in on one side and talk about some specific methods that we have dealt with and adapted. All right, so why user research? Um, the goal here is not just to build good products, but it's to build the right product. And when I say the right product, I mean a product that is for the end user. And I think this quote by IBM puts it well. User research focuses on understanding user expectations, behaviors, and needs and motivations through methodical investigative approaches. Insights are then used to ensure that all product design decisions do benefit the user. Um, and I think this is something for this space that we need to remember. Um, the products we're building are for the user. They're not for us as the developers, the designers. They're for the user in the end. And so let's work to get to that end. Um, so now let's talk about two kinds of user research. Um, if you're a designer or a researcher, this may be a 101 kind of situation, but we're going to go through it anyway. Um, we've got quantitative and qualitative. So when we're talking about quantitative research, this is evaluative research. So um, these findings will come out in measurable data, a numerical format. Some examples of this could be heat mapping. So how many times is a user clicking on a button? How many times are they missing a field? Um, eye tracking, A-B testing, etc. Um, we're going to be talking about qualitative today, which is more exploratory. Um, it sometimes gets a bad rap as sort of the softer of the research sciences, um, but the whole point of qualitative research is to observe behaviors and attitudes. Um, the findings are non-numerical, so examples here would be interviews, field studies, um, and focus groups. This is the more sort of personal research. Um, it's human connection and understanding sort of core motivations of people as opposed to just numbers. So just to give you a little bit of a snapshot, um, the point here is not to say that one of these research sides is better than the other, but it's about using them together um, to get the best research you can get. So at AirSwap, we use a combination of a ton of tools, and this is just a few. So on the quantitative side, we use a couple products. We use Hotjar and Mixpanel. Um, this is where we do our heat maps, recordings. We track our conversion funnels, KPIs, daily active users, et cetera. These are the ones that we hear a lot about. Um, so qualitative research on the other side, we have candy feature requests, so our users can free form, ask us for features, Telegram and Discord feedback channels. So again, sort of a free form avenue for our users to talk to us. And then the three that we're gonna kind of live in for the rest of our time together are surveys, field studies, and user interviews. Um, so qualitative research, we need it, Ethereum needs it, and the reason we need it is this kind of research is what takes us out of our contexts and shows us what our users really need. So it takes us out of being developers, industry insiders, designers that love Ethereum and puts us in the spot of our users to understand what they really need for products. But qualitative research is hard in Ethereum and we're gonna talk about why. Um, and I think the crux of the thing is basically this. Our users go by wallet addresses and not names. So what I mean by this, you can imagine on a traditional platform if I'm signing up for Pinterest, I'm signing up with my name, my email address, probably my date of birth if I'm <coughs> doing that. Um, I may have even checked subscribe to email list while I did that and then on top of it Maybe they have a social media presence that I'm following with an identity attached to it So in normal web 2 consumer web There is identity that is fundamentally connected to the product So when you're looking at doing recruitment or conducting research There are pretty easy avenues to get to those people to find them to know who's using it for us, on the other hand, we have wallet addresses. And for our users, this is one of the biggest value propositions of the entire thing. Their anonymity, their security is huge, and we care about that. But how do we conduct research when that's the case? Um, and it really, it goes into everything. Who even are our users? Um, where can we find them? And then if we can figure out who they are, if we can figure out where to find them, how can we actually get to know them? Again, in this true sort of human way, get to know their needs. Um, so 
we're going to start with who are our users, and we're going to talk about UX surveys. Um, so when we're talking about sort of fundamental UX surveys um, in traditional world, the goal of a survey is to gather both quantitative and qualitative insights from a lot of users at once. So this is a research method that doesn't cost a lot. Um, you can send it out to a huge distribution channel, a subscription list. Um, you can send it to a company and they can do it for you. You can then extract trends and understand all kinds of things from a lot of people. The second way this is used would be like a screener survey um, for recruiting users for future research. So for us, this piece was really interesting. We were interested in the first, of course, but we want to recruit users. We want to find these people. I mean, I personally wanted to bring them into the office. We'll talk about that later. Um, but so here's what we found. The distribution piece was hard. Um, and we've done, these are just two snapshots of a couple surveys, but we've done a ton. So when we were first doing a survey, we were like, okay, let's get it to a ton of people. Um, and so we thought maybe Craigslist, like maybe we could put together a survey that would really weed out the real crypto people, the real Ethereum people. Um, and we got a fair number of responses. We got like 80 responses, and we actually did bring three people into the office, which was a total shit show, and talk to me after if you want to hear about it. Um, but, and it was interesting. They did give us insights, but what we realized is that it wasn't quite spot on enough. That this distribution channel, it wasn't quite representative of the kinds of people that were using our products. They needed to be more savvy. So then we were like, all right, this was too broad, let's make it smaller, let's not expect as many respondents, but let's expect some quality. Um, so then we went to Telegram and Reddit, we distributed there, you can see for this survey we had 11 responses, which, you know, that's not a ton. But the thing with these responses is that they were excellent, super high quality responses. We had people responding in paragraphs and paragraphs about their experiences. They were willing to answer all of the questions and it was great. But as far as recruiting them for future research, they were not in. Of those 11 respondents, three people responded with their Telegram handles, none of which responded when I reached out to them. So we realized that our users are absolutely willing to give rich responses to these open-ended questions, as well as closed-ended questions um, in survey form, but they still want to remain anonymous. And so here, we were like, all right, we got something from it. <laughs> so there you go. That's, we're not going to get those things from it. At least not right now. OK, so where are our users? Um, let's talk about adapting UX field studies for a second. Um, the goal of field studies is to observe users in their natural environment and to situate oneself as the researcher in user-specific contexts. So coming into the Ethereum ecosystem, I come from working just, you know, with internet stuff and consumer tech. Um, and when I think of field studies, I think of, like, doing a field study for REI, going into an REI store for four hours and watching consumers look at the sunglasses, look at sweaters. This is not like that. There's nowhere I can go to find Ethereum users to watch them do their daily things, but just because we can't do it in person does not mean that we can't see what people are doing. So this is an example of what I'm going to call a field study. Um, this is a screenshot from Telegram. We were building a product for OTC traders. And so this is a trading chat room. Um, and what's really interesting here, um, there's a little bit of gibberish. WTS, hashtag Axel, 1900, 0.1 ETH, translates to want to sell 1900 Axel at price 0.1 ETH. So what's interesting here, um, we were trying to figure out how to create a really intuitive order builder for o OTC trades. So the main inputs on this thing are selecting a token and an amount to send, and then selecting a, a token and an amount to receive. Um, but what was so interesting here is that the syntax that these traders are using is not sell 1900 Axel and receive 190 ETH, which was represented in a lot of the products that were already on the market. And so what we got to do is implement a price field, which for us was a huge differentiator from what was already out there. And we heard from our traders very actively that this really helps their workflow. 
that they're thinking about what they're going to send and a price, not just what they're sending and receiving. So this is one example of how we sort of adapted field studies and applied it. So now let's talk about UX interviews. Um, we want to get to know them. And traditionally, UX interviews are all about an informal setting to really get to know someone, to get beneath what they think they want and to get at what they really want. So you're trying to uncover user motivations, feelings, needs, and pain points, and it's very personal. It's about putting a face to the person using it. Um, now, this is hard. Uh, like I said, we had some people come in, but again, they weren't quite representative of the users that we really wanted to be building for. Um, and there are a few challenges with the users that we're really trying to build for, which is that they are global, they're everywhere, they're not going to come into our New York office, um, and they, they don't exactly want their face to be seen. Um, so while we may not be able to see them, we can work to create analogous research environments over chat and through forums. So what I did was cold message people on Telegram and said, hi, I'm Chris. Um, I'd love to just talk to you about OTC. And a number of people were incredibly generous and really did talk to me. And you know, I don't have their name, but I was still able to get to a point where I started to understand who they were and what they needed. Um, some other ways that we have approached this, so that's sort of the individual connection piece. Um, we actively foster community around our products. And so we do phased product releases. On our most recent one, we start with a closed beta, um, and this is paired with a Telegram or Discord channel that we've had people sign up for, who then have conversation, give us active feedback. We implement that feedback. We do a public beta. We invite people into another channel. And so just creating a space where we can still get this informal sort of human um, feedback on the things that we're doing. <laughs> so in the end, you know, we may not have a name. And I think that what I have learned is that we don't necessarily need a name. Um, because we can still get to know our users through creatively thinking about the kinds of ways that they are interacting with the world. And the way that they're interacting with one another. So, that's pretty much it, but I would, I mean, for those of you in the room, I don't know, is anyone like a UX researcher or has conducted UX research? Okay. Yeah, tell me what you do later, because, <laughs> no, it's tough, it's tough, but it's good. Um, thank you. That's about the shit show. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you want to hear about the business? Yeah, so um, we had these interviews. The first guy came, and I was actually out on the sidewalk having a cigarette, and he came up to me, and he was clearly drunk, like actually drunk. And I was like, oh, geez. And I was like running away, and he was like, oh, is this air swap? And I was like, oh, yeah, this is air swap. And he was like, oh, I'm here for the user interviews. And I was like, Come on down. So that was the first guy. Another guy was probably a dark web criminal. And the third guy was like absolutely useless. Like, I think he just wanted the gift card. So, I mean, there were insights to be had as far as just, you know, the consumer side. These were definitely kind of like edge case people that were not exactly our people. So we were able to get something from it. Um, but yeah, that was that. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. Yes. Google everything. Yes. Well, if you, like, I'm asking if you use it. Like, I tried it in, with my team, and uh, they, like, some of them objected it. So we ended up not using it. Okay. And I wonder what you are doing. Are you I don't think it? we're using Google Analytics. Oh, we are. We use it and but they're private, so we're just tracking the events, not the actual end user. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned that the gift card. So I was wondering about like incentives. Uh, yeah. The other thing is like, you know, some of this stuff is new, new to me. But um, you know, like people bring these like unicorn badges to identify that they're here. So like, you try doing anything creative around like badges and wallets to like recruit people. And well, we did we did think about these kind of things. Um, and we used a gift card for this particular session. Yeah. And I think that was what got people in the door. But 
at the end of the day, like the people that we want to be talking about, we don't, or talking to rather, I don't think that necessarily luring them into the door are the people that we're trying to talk to. Like, you know, what we found on the surveys is like, these people want to give feedback. Um, we all want to contribute to making it better. It's just a matter of figuring out how to connect to them and find them. So anybody doing like industry-wide studies? Is, is, is there any like... Somebody must be. <laughs> you're doing on Maple too. What's that? You're doing what? There are. I see, yeah. The Rainbow team is doing yeah. on UX pattern in general. The consensus Rainbow team. It's a design system. Uh, we've done a bunch of those. And we are doing now on the industry on Layer 2. There's a talk here tomorrow on that Layer 2 design pattern. But how, how, are you, how are you connecting? With the users? Yeah, not, not actually the users, but like, like you know, a lot of a lot of product people are looking for uh, to aggregate and to understand what the trends are. So like, how do we? You know, obviously, like these individual companies have relatively small budgets, but in aggregate, you know, we need like deep research from like thousands of users. Yeah, it's uh, it's her session. If you want, we can. Talk. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. Like, is this is this, this is the the design this, talk? Okay. This oh, is the best. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, this is the room for the talk, yeah. Okay. yeah. So in terms of like, uh, are you able to identify your users and contact them directly or not? So I think that what we found is, you know, telegram handles are sometimes the extent of the identification, but the, then there are also, of course, those users that we do have actual relationships with, mm -hmm. that we know a name of, or at least a first name. Yeah. Um, but I think that, in my head, most of them are their Telegram handles. Okay. Yeah. yeah because maybe it would be interesting to see like, if you have the yeah, users that use your platform a lot to start with interviewing those, instead of some random drunk dude who wants to start. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course we've done that. I think that the idea, because I think this is always kind of a tension here, is like, do we just try to build for the people that are already using it, or are we trying to get, you know, at least a degree further towards a new user, or, you know, so I think that represents also that goal, so, yeah. Thank you. And can you talk a bit about uh, if any learnings came from the quantitative side? Did you learn something interesting? Just about the users in general? Yeah, or I don't know, you design something and you discover that something wasn't working somehow. I don't know, just uh, if any. I think, um, well, what was fun was talking to some of our users and actually sending them designs. So there are a few that we're pretty close with now that um, I've actually sent like active prototypes to, and they have like mocked them up and added comments. And you, you know, we take it with a grain of salt, they're not designers, but. It's been fun to see them sort of actively engage with what we're doing. And, and yeah. from mixed panel and Mozart, I meant uh, from that, any... Oh, the quantitative side. Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, those, I think those, and again, it being evaluative, um, it showed us, like, for example, on our Dex, our instant experience, like, we noticed that people were missing, they were clicking something that wasn't supposed to be clicked, and they were missing the thing that was supposed to be clicked. Um, and it's that kind of thing that you know you have to see that really improves it. So, yeah. Is there resistance to uh, like things like segment and tracking data? Like, do people freak out? I don't know if they freak out, but I think that in general we can say like ideologically in this space, people don't want their data to be tracked or held. Um, but I, I'm not saying from personal experience I've come up against someone you know up in arms so. about. Maybe I can add something to that. Yeah. So, um, not my previous company, but the company I worked before, we had a lot of uh, users, a lot of data. And we saw a drop of uh, basically from 100 to 70% people actually blocking uh, things like segment with uh, uh, privacy badgers. So that meant that like we were missing like a lot of traffic because of that. And then on top of that, uh, because we're European, we had the GDPR, yeah. uh, which meant that we saw another drop of 40%. So in the end, if you looked at all the traffic, we were really worried that like our traffic was actually going down uh, because over the time span of a year it was dropped like by almost 50 yeah. percent. Um, but then actually looking at the profit and other things, that was pretty good. So we saw this big mismatch between what our data was telling us yeah. uh, and then what the reality was happening uh, on our platform. So then we, re um, we went back to server-side tracking 
uh, and we wrote our own plugins to basically circumvent like a lot of the tracking uh, that was blocked. So, uh, and then we made a combination of those to actually see, okay, what is actually going on so that we can make better decisions again. Because uh, at first it was really scary to see all these drops. Was these drops were only from people blocking it or not allowing us to track it. So yeah, so I think that was, uh, was for us a very good insight to realize that, okay, you need to think differently. Uh, so that's one, and then the other thing is that uh, from a statistical point of view it's very difficult if you have like a small set of data to actually uh, make something that you can draw conclusions from. And I see a lot of uh, smaller startups actually really trying to use Google Analytics and things like this, uh, which is really not that useful unless you have like really a lot of traffic. So yeah. Um, so then things like Hotjar, actually recording sessions and looking into this. That is very useful, but also realize that a platform like Hotjar is also doing the same. So it's not recording every session, sure. but it's trying to like think, feel it like, okay, this is something significant, and then they'll uh, you. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah.